My name is Philip Trumpeter, and I was born in Roanoke, Virginia on November 22, 1952. I'm uh, 56 years old at this time. Uh, my mother and father um, were Ellen and uh, Albert Trumpeter. My mother was born in Roanoke, uh, was the daughter of uh, Russian Jewish immigrants, and my uh, and she was first generation into this country, and then <clears throat> my father um, was uh, born in Toronto, um, also first generation uh, Jewish immigrant uh, into this country. He, um, by profession, um, uh, was trained in engineering, and, uh, and unfortunately the depression came, he was accepted into MIT but couldn't go because of the money. And he came from a line of bakers uh, from Europe uh, for a couple of hundred years. And um, so his father was a baker and his mother's family were bakers. And so, um, so he helped in the bakery business. And, uh, moved from Toronto to New York to Baltimore to Newport News and then finally to Roanoke. And uh, so they were in the bakery business and we were in downtown Roanoke in the historic farmer's market and the apartment was above the store as well as the kitchen and, um, and my mother worked in the bakery. And I'm the youngest of three children. I'm an oops baby. My brother and sister are rather much older than me. Uh, they live in Roanoke now, and uh, I married for over 31 years to my wife, Serena, who I met while going to law school here in Richmond. She was originally from Brooklyn, but grew up in Richmond, and we have two wonderful children. Our oldest is our son, Jason, and he's 28, and our daughter, Jessica, is 27, and he's an engineer, and she's now a registered nurse. He lives in Detroit. He works in the car racing industry and uh, with NASCAR and related Formula One things. And my daughter has two degrees, one in English and one in nursing uh, from NYU. And she works in New York City at Sloan Kettering. So that's a little about my background uh, or from whence I come. Well, let me let me ask you a little something. Now, it must have been quite interesting growing <clears throat> up above the business. Um, what what kind of things did did your uh, parents uh, focus on in terms of what they produced? Was it breads? Was it pastries? Was it a collage of things? And were you all required to work in the bakery? Well, it, they were a bread and pastry bakery. He, uh, my father's biggest uh, commercial accounts were mostly bread. Uh, some uh, the, the historic Hotel Rono got all its bread from Trumpeter's Bakery. Uh, some other, uh, his still historic uh, uh, restaurants like the Texas Tavern and the Rono Guini Stand, which are well known in Rono, and have been there for many, many years, also procured their rolls and, um, and related products from Trumpeter's Bakery. But then there were there was the sweets uh, and the cakes and the pies and um, I uh, we were not required to work uh, in the bakery though we spent uh, we spent I spent a lot of time in that bakery uh, just because it's such a horribly difficult business um, not one that um, is family friendly because my dad would have to get up at three in the morning to get to the kitchen to begin the breads and stoke the ovens and that kind of thing and then um, um, and then and holidays you know that that those were their busiest times so um, and we, we just didn't have much of a chance to enjoy the fruits of their very hard work and labor. But they did eventually get out, sold the business and um, <clears throat> when I was young and, um, um, and that afforded us a lot more of the family uh, time together in terms of at least recreational time. But, but we were always together and, and there was a, of course a big work ethic and, and, and a 
they were very very kind and and um, and sort of thought I hung the moon so you can't get better than that. So. <laughs> so it sounds as if you've you had a really wonderful relationship with your parents even when they were working That's quite right. a bit. Would you say that they uh, imparted certain ideas into your thinking, into your philosophy of life, and if so, what were some of those ideas? I think uh, certainly issues of uh, structure, uh, expectation, setting high goals. Um, I think th they valued education, uh, they valued family, um, they um, were kind by example, um, which was always appreciated. Um, and as I said, they <clears throat> they were well. They were never judgmental of me. Uh, they always felt, as I said, that everything that I did was um, was wonderful and brilliant and charming and talented. And even though it may have been none of the above, but but nevertheless, that's how they they treated me. Um, I was interested in music early on, and um, I was a pretty good pianist as a kid, and I'd gotten um, the scholarship up to the Peabody up in Baltimore, but my concert pianist uh, uh, goals, I think, were dashed at an early age because <laughs> I flunked my um, theory class, but that's because my um, theory teacher um, every time I would go to class, uh, which was only on a one-to-one, -one, um, was a pedophile. So he always had his hands on me and eventually I just didn't go to class. And so I flunked and never told anyone. And I never did tell anyone until I was 30 years old. I did tell my parents. So, so I, I don't know, when sometimes people say things happen for certain reasons, uh, I can certainly tell you in the area of child abuse and neglect when people say, why did you take so long to tell anybody that they did that to you? I could, I could say, well, for me, it was, uh, it was many, many years, so um, I get that point. So, um, but they were always supportive of my <clears throat> pursuits and, and, and what it is that, that I wanted to do. Um, growing up in Roanoke, um, <clears throat> I'm of the Jewish faith, and there still, of course, are not very many Jewish families in a, you know, a very Southwest Virginia uh, community, and um, so that that was a challenge, um, and uh, and and there were some issues about those that particular. Um, uh, upbringing in that regard. Funny enough, um, we, uh, w my folks were very active in in the community, and, um, and but we were certainly identified as Jewish families, and and one of the Jewish families, and and just like with people of color, we were not allowed into country clubs and social clubs and. That kind of thing. So I've, I, I had that very similar experience, though I'm obviously not a person of color. But it's, it, but it did, I'm sure, shape how I, I, I saw certain things. Amazingly, I remember when I became a judge, um, 24 and a half years ago. The Roanoke Times ran that story on the front page with a very nice picture, but right in the first or second paragraph, it was stated that I was the very first a Jewish judge in Southwest Virginia. And I, I thought it, it intrigues me to this day that they would find the need to have to even report that. Um, but they did. So I'm sure that issues of, even subconsciously, of, of being different in, that, in my community from others, um, I'm sure has uh, somehow shaped how I see people who may not necessarily be in the mainstream or in the majority or, um, or have those kinds of difficulties. So that, that was a 
that was an interesting thing. But for the most part, it, I mean, people were always very kind to me, and, and I, I felt very nurtured growing up. Tell me, um, when you were in school, <clears throat> And, and of course, this was in elementary school, this was still during the time of segregation. Did you find limitations on school activities because you were Jewish or because your parents were immigrants? Um, they, there were some limitations um, in terms of, for example, sororities or fraternities that we would not have been able to have been a part of in school. Um, birthday parties that may have been at a country club or at a social club we would not be invited to, you know, for that reason. Um, so, um, but it, I don't recall it being overtly oppressive. I, I, um, I, I know, I do remember experiences where I was termed that Jewish child or uh, th there was some talk of that. I remember that my father, with some other prominent Jewish um, uh, families, had applied to memberships at some of these you know, uh, clubs as a way to sort of break in, and of course were denied that. Um, but, um, but generally speaking, um, I mean, I was always aware of it, and I, I think it, it gave me more of a sensitivity to it, um, I remember as an uh, as an older teenager, my sister, who who's older than I, uh, had married a fellow who was in the broadcasting business, and um, and one thing led to the next, and and he uh, with my sister, they decided to open the first um, um, black radio station in Southwest Virginia, which is still in existence. And I remember that that uh, there was a big harangue about that. And funny enough, the the uh, station was um, was located right in the building where the bakery that once existed was. <laughs> and um, and so I, I um, so I had interesting experiences based on that as well. Um, because it gave me an opportunity to interact more also, I think, with um, the black community, which was very certainly segregated at the time, and I, I remember, you know, there there were segregated schools, and and but I I also am aware that there was a lot of um, hatred and controversy and and some threats made to my family as a result of this and that sort of liaison uh, with the black community, but it. it it helped me certainly to see it, and and gave me other experiences that I doubt a lot of people who are not of color at the time would have had. Um, so that was, I'm sure, um, an issue that that had affected me greatly. How old were you at the time? I was, was um, I would say, in my mid-teens when they opened it. And how did? What was the perspective of your parents? Because they obviously were the recipients of some of this hatred. Mm -hmm. um, they, um, I, you know, I remember they, they always kept a pretty um, nice perspective. Um, they didn't, uh, I, I, I know that <clears throat> when they were seeking advertisers, and because that's how stations make money, um, that they met up with a lot of resistance at the time, um, but but they I, I don't recall them ever feeling deterred or or discouraged, um, and and it became a very successful operation and still is. Though my family many years ago sold it, um, but but it was an interesting experience. What motivated your sister to opening this radio station? Well, because she were, she was married to a broadcaster, oh, okay. so, so she just sort of was this joined the effort. Pardon was me. this a niche that, that they they saw needed to be filled? Yes, that? because back in, well, I, I'm not an expert in um, how one opens a radio station, but as I recall, uh, back then the FCC had to 
give, they only had certain frequencies open and you would bid on that and they were very stingy about how they would um, uh, offer those opportunities and because it was meant to be the first black radio station, um, my guess is, is, or my recollection is, is that the FCC found that more appealing to grant that license and, and give permission for the opening of that station and, and the ownership of that frequency. So um, that's kind of how that played out. So, um, so they had to find a niche in order to go into the business. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that there was any um, negative reaction toward you in school? Uh, no, I, I think a lot of people were more intrigued uh, by it. And uh, I remember a lot of my associates thought it was kind of cool. I remember that when black entertainers would come to town, uh, the station always seemed to somehow sponsor it. Uh, James Brown came many times, and I remember the chance to meet him many times. I remember we would go to the airport, and he would fly in on his private plane, and I'd get to go in, and and you know, and he got to know me, and and uh, and that was a neat experience. Uh, but of course, you're in, you're just a young teenager, and one gets easily dazzled at that age. But but nevertheless, I remember that that my friends thought that that was neat or cool and, and uh, so I, I don't, I never suffered any, any uh, hardship over, for, at least from my peers, of, about my family's association with the radio station. Well it sounds like you had a very interesting upbringing. Well I did and, and then my folks let me sort of really fly the coop and see what the other side of the world looked like so I I left there after graduation and went to New York University in New York City. So I had never been to New York until my first day at school. Before I ask you some questions about that, I want to go back for a moment and ask you a little bit about some of the teachers who really impacted your life and, and what you found yourself gravitating towards in terms of interest. You said you were very interested in being a concert pianist at one point. Um, so tell me a little bit about that, both from elementary and of course I had junior high school at that time mm -hmm. and then high school. Well, I, um, I, I loved playing the piano and um, we lived, um, after the bakery uh, time, we, we lived in a very small three-bedroom apartment um, uh, <laughs> until I was 13 years old. And I, my brother and I not only shared a room, we shared a bed. And, um, and um, there was an old piano. My dad owned this apartment building, and there was an old piano in the basement that was horribly out of tune and horrible in terrible condition, but nevertheless, you know, I said that I'd, I'd really like to learn how to play, and that was the only piano I really had access to. And as time went on, um, I, I really had a talent, I thought at the time, you know, for playing piano, and, and my folks were very supportive, and then they bought me a real upright piano, which was put into the um, apartment. And then when we were able when my folks uh, bought a home, eventually, a large, uh, nice home uh, versus apartment living from birth, um, my uncle, who never married, and, and I was, I guess, sort of the apple of his eye, uh, <clears throat> was very supportive of me playing the piano, and he then bought me a baby grand uh, that I have to this day. It's, it's a nice dining way, and, and uh, so I, I so that was always very helpful, and my piano teacher, Mrs. Nash, was of course a huge mentor for me and very encouraging, and um, assisted me in competitions and those kinds of things. Um, but on the other side of the coin, um, I was, um, though I guess perhaps objectively would have been considered a somewhat precocious child, I, I was of a small child, and uh, I, I'm not going to say sickly, but um, small and almost frail-like, and um, um, 
often sometimes not too well and and um, and because of that uh, I was growing up like that even into high school and and, and you're a boy that's kind of a <laughs> that's kind of a hard um, a hard nut to crack as, as they would say and I guess that I I was able to overcome it uh, I suppose through you know some nice friends who sort of took me under their wing and I think other teachers who who assisted me and uh, felt that I was a bright kid so I you know might run for a class officer and get that and one little by little sort of was able to crawl my way up because back in those days you know you weren't much of anything if you if you didn't play football or basketball or something like that and just because of my stature I was just not the person that would be engaged in those activities. So uh, I, I suppose my other, in terms of regular school teachers that were very, most important to me um, was Mrs. Ferris in the sixth grade and, uh, and she allowed me to be a patrol boy which was a big deal and uh, it was a crossing guard. Mm -hmm. Uh, around the school, and it was a neighborhood school, and I walked to school. We lived three blocks away, so uh, she was wonderful. And then um, I think my very favorite teacher uh, in all of my public school career uh, was in the eighth grade. It was she was she's an she was an English teacher at the time. Her name was Mrs. Renner, and she um, was married. Uh, rather new, uh, newly married and had three, they had three small children, but her husband was a career man with the Marines and back then was the Vietnam War. So he was in Vietnam for many tours of duty and she was just an extraordinary individual and, and the whole class thought she was and, and um, she really gave me a much broader view and a love of um, literature and and uh, and just more creative thinking and and was just very encouraging in that and I um, I have to laugh about it because um, as the years went on she had to leave Roanoke because her husband was in the military so for a time I lost touch with her and she lived in Europe with her family for a while because of that and uh, some years ago um, I took my family on a trip to New York City. Our kids were young teenagers then, and um, they wanted to go to the Today Show, and it was around the Christmas holiday. And we were trying to think of something that might get the camera's attention. Well, we were staying with my cousin, or shall I say at my cousin's apartment, so I, I, um, uh, around here and around my friends uh, and known I, I'm a very good cook and as is my wife but of course I came from very good cooks and bakers so so one of the things after I became a judge that I would make just as a a little gift to, to um, folks and the court system particularly was fudge and so we thought we should give it a name and we called it the judge's fudges so and my wife even had labels made and I make this judge's fudges every Christmas time you know to give to friends at Hanukkah and Christmas and well anyway I would, when, since we were going on this trip to New York I decided that uh, I bring I'll leave some of the judge's fudges for my cousin well I had a little extra so uh, so when we went to the Today Show, my kids said, Dad, why don't you bring the judges fudges and offer it to like Matt and Katie and Ann. <laughs> and I said, oh, they're never going to do it. I said, okay, let's do that. So, so I did, and sure enough, they just zoomed right in on me and, 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 and just made a big, big deal. So all these people, all my friends and relatives across the United States sees me on the Today Show including that teacher, Mrs. Renner, who I had lost touch with. And so finally I was able to reconnect with her, but it was a, that, that, that was a true silver lining of that experience and, uh, and how just we were able to reconnect. So um, a very important individual in my life.
What, how was she so important to you? Well, again, I think just giving me more self-confidence about um, uh, just my thinking and, and looking at the world and, and self-confidence as a student and my goals and um, again I think overcoming my small stature and 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 uh, perhaps not as not the same interests that that other people my age might have had um, it, it, she was always very encouraging so. did she help you to um have a uh, favorite author? Um, she helped me to have an appreciation for lots of authors um, and exposed me you know, to lots of literature and poetry. Um, and I think is one of the main reasons why I was brave enough to leave Roanoke to go to a major city and experience a world that I was unfamiliar with. Because back in the day, uh, at least in my high school in Roanoke, if you went to college, and you didn't necessarily do that back then, but if you did, then you know most of my <clears throat> student friends would absolutely pick nearby Virginia schools. So it was very radical, almost, that I would consider leaving the state, but particularly to go up to the Northeast to a place like New York City. And I think that that and then that Mrs. Renner was one of those people that was responsible for me sort of seeing what the other side of the world would look like. So did you end up having then a favorite uh, philosopher that you like to read that helped inspire you? Well, I was not, um, well, I should say that um, in terms of authors, they were true literature people they were philosophers back in high school. Um, I, funny enough, I uh, <laughs> once I got to college, I didn't think that I was talented enough to be an English major, but I, but in having a very liberal arts curriculum, um, I was it, 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 philosophy and religion studies really sort of caught my eye and and really appealed to me. And, and because I was never exposed to that, um, it, you know, back in those days, high school curriculums didn't have religious studies or philosophy. Um, you know, you were just a straight English lit kind of um, um, track and, and that would have been the most uh, that you would get in terms of your exposure. So. I think she, I think those influences allowed me to then feel more comfortable to pursue those other interests. Did she recommend NYU? Um, she did, and as did others. Um, I looked at several in, in the Northeast, and I, um, I had, I had looked at Columbia as well, and. I was a little too afraid of Columbia because it, it, it Columbia is north of Manhattan technically, and back then it was it, again it was the turbulent early '70s, and and I I don't think that I was uh, prepared for to make that kind of leap. NYU was a little more comfortable to me given that it was right in the heart of Greenwich Village, and, and I just thought I would feel a little more at ease in, in that particular environment. So. How did your parents feel about you going so far away? Um, they, they were, again, very supportive. They missed me uh, a lot, um, but they, they were very, very supportive. But I, I'll tell you um, <laughs> that I was very naive, I mean, very naive. And, and I, um, because I, I'm not exaggerating that in, in high school, I mean, the, the most exposure that I had to delinquency or drugs would have been beer, you know, and, and I didn't even partake, you know. Um, and, and I, and in terms of just people, you know, other than of color, but but other than that, I just had no other exposure to people who may have been different or other experiences. Uh, I, I remember the uh, one thing that caused my folks alarm 
is that um, the, the very first or second week that I was there, my dorm at NYU um, was taken over by um, the Gay Federation of Greenwich Village. I mean, they literally, literally occupied it and took it over because over the summer they would rent out their, their main hall you know, to groups, and they rented it out for, as I recall, a nude men's beauty contest. Well, to get by NYU, they couldn't say who they were and what they were doing. Well, apparently a few days before, um, um, they were found out, so they canceled the contract. So the gay lib of Greenwich Village got real angry, and then they just did a sit-down, and they they just literally took over our, our building. And I'll never forget it was covered by the national news. And this is in the day of Walter Cronkite and CBS News and others. And they all came to my hall, Weinstein Hall in New York City, um, and, and, um, and made it a huge story. And my folks saw it on the national news. And apparently, as I was coming out of the dorm, um, I couldn't get by, and I said, would you excuse me, please? And apparently it was one of the leaders of the gay lib, and they got mad at me, and he hit me right in the face, and this was caught on camera. And, and my folks saw that and on national television. And, <clears throat> you know, I had never met a gay person until I went to New York. I'd never been exposed to marijuana or other drugs, but <clears throat> I will tell you, frankly, and again, these were the turbulent early 70s and the hippies and, and all of that, and I'm right in Greenwich Village, but I mean, that was just beyond abundant <laughs> and, and accepted. I mean, we would laugh that when I would get off the elevator on the floor to my dorm on the sixth floor, I mean, the smoke from the hash pipes and the weed and was so heavy that you couldn't see from my elevator to the door of, uh, of at the end of the hall just from all of that wafting in the air. I mean, so what I'm saying is, is that from drugs to just anybody that was different or a different faith, uh, it, it was a it was an amazing experience. I I, I think I am the most proud. If someone said, "What a." top five things you're most proud of that you were able to overcome. I think the fact that I was brave enough to just stick it out, being from Roanoke, Virginia, and I had a very Southern accent, and I was the only Southerner I know in the place, and people would take my hand and and down the hall and say, here, talk, talk, let's all hear you talk, and like I was uh, almost a freak of nature. and and. Um, and but I endured it, and and it was a fabulous experience and, and a rich experience. And uh, but I look back on it, and I'm just amazed that I was brave enough to do it. So so when your parents saw you get hit on national on national television, <laughs> I, I, and knew that the gay lib of Greenwich Village had taken over our dorm, and and you know and. So did they thinking, put pressure on you to come back? Well, no. Finally, the universe and the police, you know, intervened, and they finally settled their differences and got out. But, but they, it was for quite a few days that 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 went on, and I had, you know, I did reassure them. My parents were older parents, and um, and as I said, I came along. <laughs> uh, I know they were happy for the accident, but but they were older parents, so um, they they had a trust in me that probably now that I'm a parent, I would never have had uh, or never would have engaged in with my children. Uh, not to say that I don't trust my children, I do completely, but uh, but almost to a point of giving up um, the supervision uh, that they thought was maybe necessary. So. Um, but thankfully, I didn't go astray or anything. So. Well, now, after that event happened, I guess you were, in a way, a celebrity on, <laughs> on campus. I was wondering if that changed. Oh, I don't think I was a celebrity on campus. But, you know, again, uh, we're talking about a major urban university with uh, what was then feeling like a gazillion 
people with protests with the war and with human rights and civil rights and I mean all of that was going on you know back in the day so did um, you get involved in any of these uh, movements or activities I got involved a bit in the civil rights movement I did a few marches you know down Fifth Avenue um, I um, um, I was I was engaged in, in that way. Um, I didn't travel, you know, for example, I didn't take any leave of absence and travel down south or anything of that nature. Uh, just, and nothing, nothing noteworthy except to say that, that I got involved in that. What, what made you get involved in the civil rights movement? Well, I, I think it was all, I, I think it was really, a lot of that was sort of my, um, my experience of growing up in Roanoke, the way I grew up in Roanoke, and sort of seeing that kind of thing. I, you know, I, my mother didn't drive until she was in her late 40s, so we always took the bus everywhere. So I, I remember, you know, I remember that people of color sat in the back and that I sat in the front, and I remember the Woolworths counter, and I remember uh, the drinking fountains, and I, I never ever liked that, and I just didn't. I, but I don't say that with any sense of, oh, well, gee, I'm wonderful, and mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was just a blip in the radar, but, um, you know, looking back, I probably could have done a lot more than I did. Um, I wasn't brave, and, and I don't want to come off that way because I wasn't. Um, I, I had to kind of ease my way. I think I'm brave today, but back then I, uh, I was brave in my own way, but I had to, you know, remember I was a child of a small sort of southern place and going to literally an environment that was unlike any I would have ever imagined. So I had to ease into into all of that, and it was a little, it was very intimidating. At, at what point did you develop this real interest in going into the religion and philosophy as a major, and did some of these experiences influence that decision? Oh, I think <clears throat> I think that it did. I mean, I can't say there's anything I could point to that led me into into that. I I just think it's it sort of evolved. It was it was. Um, we had some remarkable. Um, we had some remarkable professors. One in particular, uh, Professor Gerland, who was, who taught existentialism and and uh, and knew Sartre and other great philosophers. And and uh, one of my other professors was, uh, you know, uh, had had also aligned himself with some of the. The, the great modern 20th century uh, philosophers. So um, I just thought that that was really intriguing. And, and, um, and I was given license, if you will, by my family to, to have a very liberal arts education. And, and that's, that's what I decided to do. I, I would also confess that, again, because of my, a bit my timidity, which may be given what I do for a living today and my stature today it may not seem to jive, but, but I, I was rather timid and shy in, in so many ways. So, um, you know, it's, it's just something that I, I had to, to, to really develop and, and, I, um, and I really um, am grateful that, my, you know, that my parents kind of, you know, gave me that strength and, and, and reassurance to do it. But it, it was not an easy journey, but it was um, one that I feel very lucky and blessed to have had the opportunity to take. Yeah. What were some of the ideas that, that you learned as a philosophy and religion major that really impacted your life and, and became kind of your uh, added to what your parents taught you, your mantra, so to speak? 
Um, well, just being exposed to the different religions because, you know, for the most, I mean, of course I was familiar with the Christian faith, but um, I, I had, for example, most of my roommates were Italian Catholics, a lot of them from New Jersey <laughs> and Long Island, and um, and I... I couldn't do it today, but by the time I finished my undergraduate education, I was able to say the entire Catholic Mass in Latin. You know, because I went to so many Masses with them, because they would always invite me to their homes for their feasts and, you know, and their holidays. So um, it gave me, I think, a lot more um, a broad understanding of, of very many types of people and very many types of, of beliefs and you know and not to mention the war protests and the civil rights movements and all of that just really uh, appealed to me. Um, I, I also though have to say that I didn't think I was terribly intelligent enough to head on any movement uh, or, or anything of that nature. I, I, I'd like to think that <clears throat> that there are things that I was able to do as an adult, as a professional, and ultimately as a judge that, that may fall more in that category, but not in that day, you know. And that day, uh, I felt very much like a, a watcher and just sort of had to ease myself into my comfort zones. Mm -hmm. Had you framed in your mind what you wanted to do at that point? Uh, because it seems as if early on you had kind of given up the idea of being a concert pianist. <laughs> so had you, had you found, had you thought about a niche? I had not in college thought about a niche and, and, and it is true that, that as my college was ending I, I needed to think about that and uh, and admittedly, that's why I went to law school, because to be very frank, I didn't know what else to do, uh, which is not the reason anyone should go to law school. I just thought, well, that would be an honorable pursuit, and I bet mom and dad wouldn't mind if I pursued it. But I, I can't say that I went into that with any thought that I was going to, uh, by any means, change the world or that it was a springboard from what I had been doing into something else. I mean, of course it can be, but I was not sophisticated enough to get that at that point. So I went to law school for all the wrong reasons, uh, just simply because I didn't know what else to do with my life, and I just thought that nobody would hassle me that I pursued that interest. Um, so once I got to law school, um, because I had no experience with the whole study of law. Uh, people had told me it's like learning a different language and try to hang in there, and the first year is the worst year. And, and I, I think I gave a lot of lip service back. I, don't, I know I didn't understand that at all, and it really threw me. I mean, I just thought I had made a terrible mistake, a terrible mistake. And it, it, it was very traumatic. It was traumatic. Just, I, I had no idea and I was not prepared. Um, what was most traumatic about I, I think the whole thing, you know, the whole getting used to the language of reading cases and, and how you researched things. And, um, and the thing that I found the most traumatic was and it was my perception then that my classmates, most of whom were older than me, um, were so unidimensional in their thinking. I, I remember vividly thinking that. Um, and I, I, it almost offended me. And I, I, uh, I just, it was a hard adjustment. I, um, th I think again, the reason that I stuck it out and I did well in law school, but but I stuck it out only because I'm one of these people that tends not to quit anything I start. I, I mean, we all. I mean, I and I guess most of us can't say that, that we always follow through. But but generally speaking, I I really do follow through, and and 
I, I just decided, well, let me just get through this because Lord knows I have no intentions of being a lawyer. So, um, <laughs> but I made nice friends and, and, uh, and back in the day, they don't allow this now, but back in the day, if you maintain a particular grade point average, you could take the bar exam in Virginia in your third, right after your first year of your third, last year, of, excuse me, right after your first semester of your last year of law school. So um, I decided to do that, thinking this would just be a nice little practice run. And, um, <laughs> And of course, I signed up for my bar review courses. We all do. And back then, you know, people would say, "Well, you know, Virginia is a hard bar, and it is. And it, it, it's it. One thing that makes it hard is that it's one of those states that examines you on one of the, the broadest areas of the law than other states do. So that complicated." the study for the bar, again, I wasn't prepared until they told me that, you know, when you finish this subject on this day with your professor, with your bar review book, that's it. You don't get to go back because we got to keep moving on and keep moving on. And, and, and it was, it, it, and that really is true, or it was at the day. And I remember that I just gave it my all. And by then I had met the lady who's now my wife, Serena, and she was very supportive. And, uh, and I remember that the only thing, we, we didn't date during that time, you know, we hardly saw each other, but the only thing that I remember I indulged myself with is that Roots, remember the series Roots? That was the year, my last year of law school was when Roots came out and it was on TV, you know, it was a smash. So I indulged myself every week that I would watch that episode of Roots. But I remember that that was all, that was it, that was all my fun. And then I remember that um, uh, my apartment was in the west end of Richmond and I was so paranoid that I would miss the test that I, I, and other students did this too, I checked into the John Marshall Hotel, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. The building does, but the hotel closed. And that's where they did the, the winter bar in, in Richmond at the John Marshall. So the night before, I decided I was going to get a room just because I didn't want my car to break down or have a flat tire. And, and, and my, my then girlfriend, now wife Serena, drove me in her car down to the John Marshall. And I remember we're going down Monument Avenue and they had that big neon sign that said the John Marshall. And tears were just rolling down my face. And Serena, my wife said, what's wrong, Phil? And I said, Serena, I am so scared because this is the first experience I've ever had in my life where I can say, if I don't pass this, there's nothing more I'll know to do. I mean, and, and that philosophy, if you will, background, probably it, that moment really came back to bite me because, you know, in my many experiences and, and academic pursuits, one thing I learned is we can all do something better. You know, whatever we do in our friendships and our relationships, and a job that we have, whatever it is, we could all do it better if we really think about it. But that was the one experience going into that I was absolutely convinced that if I was not successful at, that there, there would be nothing more that I could do. And it was, it was a terrifying moment. And that was the reason I started crying because I said, you know, I went into this thinking, oh, this will just be a practice run, but it's not a practice run because in my mind, if I don't get this down, um, there's no sense me ever taking it again because there'll, there'll be nothing more that I could do. Well, amazingly, and we all say that when we pass the bar, I passed the bar right at that time. So I passed the bar at the same time I graduated from law school, and then by then I was fully in love with my then girlfriend, now wife, and just got really confused because I 
really didn't think I wanted to be a lawyer despite my success. And then I had fallen in love with Serena, but I didn't know what to do about that. And should I get married? Should I ask her to marry me? Should I not? And I was in Roanoke back then, and I literally did nothing for six months. I mean, it was nothing, complete downtime. I almost went catatonic. And uh, <laughs> finally my parents said, you better do something. So, um, so uh, I had thought that I wanted to go back to New York and pursue, um, maybe go back to school to go into advertising. You know, I thought that would be a good mix because I, I thought I was fairly creative and pretty glib and that might be a good pursuit for me. But, uh, but as I said, it was a critical moment in my life and I did ask Serena to marry me and in the meantime, I, I went to work for a small law firm while I was waiting to decide what I would do. And as luck would have it, uh, the main uh, guy there it was a, is a fellow named Ed Kidd, who ultimately, ultimately became a well-known general district court judge from Roanoke, who's now retired. And he really did take me under his wing. And back then, um, he was what, what in our Virginia law we call a special justice, who's the special hearing officer that conducts hearings for people who are seriously mentally ill and who are refusing or can't take treatment because they're not able to give consent. And he was a special hearing officer who would conduct these involuntary civil commitment hearings. And so I became very involved in that. And, and, and it was, again, a pivotal moment in my life. Just something clicked and, and I just loved it. And I loved mental health law and I liked family law. And, um, and then he went on the bench and I became Roanoke's sort of big cheese as this, you know, met this special justice. And from an advocacy standpoint, um, became very involved with the Mental Health Association and its movement and became uh, its president and then went to the state level. And then right about that same time, uh, Virginia was um, worried about the numbers of children who suffered from emotional uh, disturbances and illnesses who, in order to receive treatment, were, were literally having to leave their homes and go great distances. So we, so the Mental Health Association embarked on this study called the Invisible Children's Project, and they asked me if I would head it. And, and it was so fortuitous only because, um, at the same time, uh, Jay Lark then noticed it and decided to do its study. And then also at the same time, I went to a conference at UVA at the Institute of Law, Psychiatry, and Public Policy, which is now and then and now uh, headed by um, Richard Bonney. And uh, one of his grad students had done a study uh, indicating that special justices like me were the armpit of the mental health system of Virginia. Well, of course, that just alarmed me horribly and insulted me horribly, and I took it personally and arose out of the audience and said, how could you say that? And I challenged him, well, you know, what's the best way to, um, to engage your enemy? And that's to take him under your wing. So Richard did do just that, and at the same time, uh, uh, then Delegate Warren Stamball from Northern Virginia uh, decided to study the mental health system of Virginia. Sadly, Delegate Stamball died young uh, of an aneurysm, but before his death, um, he allowed me with Richard Bonney to sort of be a, a part of a small cadre of people where we had the privilege uh, of working on a complete rewrite of the mental health legislation here in Virginia uh, before this last one. Uh, that was the, the most major one from its time. And, and I think that whole experience and those few years of being immersed in that, uh, both in what I was doing professionally locally as well as the state uh, effort and just being part of that movement, uh, there's no question that that was the single most influential reason 
uh, why um, I was appointed to the bench um, as a JNDR judge. Um, I was 31 at the time when I got the endorsement. Uh, I had only been in practice for a little over five years. Um, I was looking back on it. Um, that would not happen, I don't think, today, nor should it. Um, and I probably, <laughs> I probably was too young in many ways to have gone on the bench, with one exception, and that is that I, I think that youth allowed me to have the vitality and energy to really get in there. And, and, and given my personality and sort of my involvement, that's, um, that, you know, as they say, the rest is history. And I think that that, that allowed me to, to be a part both in the community as well as with some statewide efforts to, you know, get some really good things going, uh, you know, to help our kids and families while still staying very involved uh, with uh, the mental health movement, which I'm still involved with today. So um, back then also, um, with the help of a friend through the Mental Health Association, we started a support group for family members of mentally ill persons called Families in Touch. So uh, I got to, to uh, facilitate that and we met every two weeks at the Mental Health Association of Roanoke and got to meet so many wonderful families and sort of guide them through the, the real agony and trauma of how mental health issues affect our families, you know, whose loved ones are afflicted with this serious disease. So, um, so that's kind of how I think all of that evolved for me. Well, I'm, I'm curious because it seems that between college and that moment when you were appointed to, to the court, that a sea change in, in your outgoing nature occurred. And so I'm curious, do you think it, it began to be framed in college and somehow really transformed by the time you uh, went to law school, or was it even later than that? Um. I remember perceiving that getting into and going to law school was a very big deal. Now, I, I don't know if I were to visit law schools throughout Virginia today, and I do, but I never ask these questions of the students, do you feel particularly privileged or quite extraordinary that you were accepted and that you're going to be part of this great profession? I, I don't take the opportunity to ask that, um, um, but I can absolutely tell you that that's how I felt <laughs> when I was in law school. So I, I think that that did help give me a lot of self-confidence in terms of what it is that, that I was uh, able to do. Um, because my mom and dad didn't get to go to college, uh, I, 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 again, it was just another, <laughs> another uh, perhaps part of my journey that they were, that they did get to see and, and just took enormous pride in. So, so again, I think that, that that really helped me. But there's no question that the biggest sea change came uh, when I was able to be involved um, with serving uh, mentally ill persons in Roanoke and, and understanding mental illness. Um, did you get involved with that because you had an interest, or were you sort of put in that situation? I think no. it was it was both. They invited me to into their fold once I became well. I, before I became a special justice, I would represent as an attorney uh, the patients who were involved in those hearings. But yes, I, I they were. It was kind of a mutual. Um, um, sort of meeting and invitation and and they encouraged me to get involved and and to see and and it, it was just so illuminating I mean that truly was a sea change in my life because to this moment you know I, I feel that mental persons stricken with mental illness I mean for me I think it's the worst disease ever you know, because it doesn't kill you, but it's 
horrendously serious. It never goes away, and and it it affects every part of that person's life, particularly their family, their ability to function, their ability and and how it is they see their place in our universe. It it, it is horrific, and 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 affects so many people so tragically, although it doesn't always have to. So um, the challenge is to help make sure it doesn't. And and uh, and that was so inspiring. And to this minute, I mean, they're the people I admire the most in their families. And, and for me, they gave me gazillions back more than I ever gave them. Because just in terms of the understanding and the insight, and there's no question, that, that that's what most prepared me, you know, to go on the bench in terms of having empathy, in terms of, of understanding crises that can affect kids and families and, and, and all levels, and, and really how <clears throat> many forms of mental illness and, and related disorders like substance abuse uh, disorders or addiction disorders um, you know, come into play and, and, you know, make us humans so frail. So, um, Did you find that you had to do a lot of background research? Oh, there's really no question. Understand? And and by, by, by being, uh, thankfully, in Roanoke, and, and sadly, this to this day doesn't always happen this way, but in Roanoke, even when I started, we made sure that those hearings were done in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Uh, we didn't bring them in shackles and change into the court and handcuffs and, and in a court environment, a courtroom environment. Um, we went to the hospital um, where the patient was, and that's where we did the hearings. And um, was that unusual? It can't. Yes, I mean, it, back then it was very unusual, and even today there are there are courts that conduct. Uh, involuntary civil commitment hearings, not at the hospital. Um, Who was responsible for having that at the hospital? That's the judge's decision. That's the, either the special justice or judge's decision. And was that something that you initiated? I, I didn't initiate it. Ed Kidd, my predecessor, had done it that way. But in terms of my education, um, it um, afforded me, because I was based at the hospital, I mean, I had almost my own office right in the emergency room of the hospital, because when there's a, a psychiatric emergency, they enter through the emergency room. So I, I, I kid to this day to my physician friends that I've already done my residency in psychiatry, now I just need to go to medical school and I'll be set to go. But, but being based at the hospital, you know, not only did I see what happens in crisis with mental illness, but um, I got to know the pharmacology of it. Uh, I got to understand that it's a brain disease, that your brain is an organ, just like your heart and kidneys, and though there's no cure, there are many controls, and, and the remarkable world we live in today with medicines that can assist with that. Now, I know there's a lot of criticism about issues of medication, particularly for children and, again, with other related uh, disabilities for them, such as ADD and ADHD and, uh, and, and other types of, of disorders. But nevertheless, it, it taught me to know that, it, that your brain is an organ and that you have to tend to it, and we, that we have to insist that our uh, that our folks stricken with this disease tend to it. They can tend to it, um, but you know, as as my advocacy work taught me, mental illness is the only disease for which you can be arrested, and and that's still to this day true. So um, so it's it's an issue that always has permeated. My life personally, as as well as professionally, um, and, and, and no question made me a better person. Had you imagined when uh, you were in college that you would be returning to Virginia, and in particular returning to Roanoke? Was there something that was pulling you back? 
I mean, pulling you back home? Well, I think my indecisiveness is what pulled me back home. And, you know, and, and despite what Shakespeare is saying, you can go back home. And, and, and I did. <laughs> so, um, so that's what pulled me back home. Did, was that my agenda? No. I mean, it was not. I mean, I really thought I was going to return to New York City or, or, or pursue other interests. It's not to say that I didn't want to come back home. I had nothing against coming back um, uh, or being near my family. That was never an issue. But, but it's just to say, in terms of my outlook and my interests, um, um, that was uh, something that really wasn't on my radar at the time. And, 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 and keep in mind, too, that because I had four years of experience in New York City coming from Roanoke, I mean, there's no question that when I came to Richmond to come to law school that I, you know, I just pained to, to go back to see a Broadway show or to see a great museum exhibit or, or, to, or to just, you know, experience the great culture of, of one of the world's most world-class cities. So, so selfishly, I guess, just because I wanted to continue to have that fun, um, I wanted to return. But, but it's not to say that that was really my goal. I, I just didn't know. Again, remember, I went to law school for all the wrong reasons. So, what so, made you choose the University of Richmond, by the way? Uh, well, um, I thought that it would, because it was in our state capital, I'd never, you know, I, I have cousins here, uh, so I'd been to Richmond a few times, but I thought coming from New York City, oh, my folks, by the way, said, if you, if you want us to help you, we really would like you to come closer to home. So I thought, well, of the Virginia schools, this would be a nice pick because, you know, it's Richmond, I'm coming from New York, um, I won't be in, I won't be shocked again so much culturally. But that really wasn't true either. I mean, Richmond was a shock. Um, I mean, even if I'd come from Roanoke, it would have been a shock because Richmond is, is literally the heart of the South historically, I think. And, and I just didn't know about that society and, and it's, it's, you know, the role it really did play and, and how the people are still playing it out and, and or at least I thought at the time. So I, I, I just... Uh, Is that what you meant by kind of unidimensional? Yes, yes. So I, I just felt that um, it, it, it was a much bigger shock where I thought it would be an easier transition. It, w it actually turned out to be a bit of a shock. So... Um, but again, I, I met nice people, um, and um, um, that's kind of how that phase happened. Now, when you were hired um, in the law firm in Roanoke, mm -hmm. did you know the attorney prior to applying for the position? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, I, I, I just knew of them, but no, I didn't. And it was always meant, it was really only meant to be a stopgap. Until I got married in the spring, and then, you know, Serena and I would decide from there because she mostly had grown up in New York and, and Richmond, and she had never been to Roanoke, and I didn't know if she was going to like it. And, you know, we kid her that, you know, she still ha sounds like she just got off the A train. And, I mean, she has a very thick Brooklyn accent to this minute. So I just didn't know if she would like it. And, and so I was trying to stay open-minded. But um, I, I, uh, I really guess I mean this in every spiritual, religious, or karma-like way anyone wants to take it. But I really think that it was all kind of meant to be for me. Uh, I mean, I love what I have had the chance to do. I love that I got this position. I, I feel I'm the most lucky guy in the whole world in every way. I, I just think it's been extraordinary. And 
because it was not ever something that I set out to do. I just really feel it was providential. I do. That's interesting. When you um, kind of found part of your niche, and I'm going to call it part of your niche, the, the mental health issues, did you know at that moment that this was something that would be a passion of yours, or did you find that you evolved, in a sense, into really um, finding this uh, of great importance and seeing all the connections in society? I, um, I do feel that it was um, cathartic, but also um, a passion that I was never going to lose sight of. I mean, it was never going to be just something on my resume. I mean, I mean, I've been involved with lots of things, and some of them do look good on a resume. My involvement with mental health is not meant ever, never was meant to, nor will it ever be considered part of a resume. I mean, it's something that I really carry within me because it's, uh, it, 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 te it taught me and still teaches me so many things about uh, just human nature and the human condition and, and, and the importance of, of um, understanding families who are not like you or or who really struggle with um, real barriers that you may not have been fortunate enough I mean, that you are fortunate enough not to have to confront uh, in demons that you're just fortunate enough not to have to confront so um, and because in the judge business I mean there's judges and there's judges and and in the work that I do, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know what people regard me like, but, but I, I, I think that, I think we all have to be bright and intelligent, so to speak, but, but it takes way more than that to do what it is, in my opinion, uh, that we're asked to do and required to do to, to make you much more effective. And I, I, for example, I know judges in all levels of court who, you know, who are far brighter than me, but who I might consider not to have the the hu the understanding of, of the human condition, and as as well as maybe I've had the good fortune to learn about and experience about, you know just through not just my experience but just my real involvement um, with the mental health movement so uh, I need to do more there's no question I can always do more um, do you think that issue is uh, a, a crucial element that may be missing from even the training of judges who have to deal with people um, at the level of the juvenile court or um, uh, the district court? Well, remember that we we do not have to have a certain prescribed training or licensure in this area to do what we do. I, I, I will say that that I in my court um, I meet many judges with many backgrounds uh, I think they all have the very best of intentions, and I think they want to be good judges, and I think they want to learn I, uh, more and more, and I know I want to as well, but, but as we all know, uh, there's, judges are appointed by the General Assembly for all kinds of reasons, <laughs> um, but however they get their job, just like however I was fortunate enough to get mine. I, I am happy to say that I've not met any JNDR judges who at least say to me that they don't want to learn about these issues and, and, and all kinds of facets that, that affect our court. And, and for that, I think that we have a nice judiciary in that, in that way. 
Well, let me talk a little bit about your role um, on juvenile court. Who or who or what persons were really responsible for uh, putting your name out there to be selected? Well, Ed Kidd, who I had mentioned earlier, who be went on the bench uh, before me, uh, there's uh, no question that, that he always was a huge, big cheerleader of mine. Um, now deceased uh, Judge Beverly Fitzpatrick was always a big fan and a big supporter of mine. Um, um, back then, um, then Delegate Richard Cranwell was a, a very kind supporter of mine, uh, as was Chip Woodrum at the time. Uh, these gentlemen are no longer, they've since retired uh, as members of the General Assembly. Um, the bar, you know, back in the day, and, and I might add that, you know, I've been on the bench a long time compared to other judges, so, and, and I know being selected as a judge in 2009 is, is a high honor, but back when I was selected, um, I can absolutely tell you it was a big, big thing, and and with just almost enormous uh, play and and a build up, and it, it, it was it was a just a great thing, and it and maybe maybe just because of the passage of years, maybe it's wishful thinking, or maybe I just don't remember something, but. I don't remember it being nearly as, quote, political <laughs> or having those considerations come in uh, uh, back then as, as, they, as I know they play out about today. And um, so with that said, I, uh, because my locality uh, and our delegation very much listened to and wanted the input of the Bar Association and the community, it was, again, something that was a very gracious, almost, selection process and, and, and something that, that meant a great deal and it was a huge and high honor. My folks were getting very elderly at that time and my dad had suffered a bad heart attack and a stroke uh, before I went on the bench and I... <laughs> I remember, thank God, they were there at my investiture. Uh, because my, my, my dad was always an emotional guy, but he was a tough guy. But because of the stroke, as sadly with many folks who suffer from strokes, it's common that, that they become a little bit more emotionally labile. But, um, but I remember that just as I was about to uh, take the oath that my father burst out crying in the courtroom and, and it was very audible. And, and I am so happy that the reporter of, in the Roanoke Times noted that in the second paragraph of the article, you know, after saying I was the first Jewish judge in that area, they also noted, though, that my father, you know, had burst out crying. And I just, I just want to say that it, it was just, it was a much bigger deal. And, and I don't think it's just wishful thinking or just the luxury of, because it was over 24 years ago, but I, it really, I really mean that. So, so, um, I mean, if I had been elected president of the United States, I don't think it would have been any more thrilling than, than getting you know this appointment. And uh, and and not to mention that that it is the most important court in the land. It's the best court. It's 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 such a vital court. Um, I mean, I I feel such pride of of being able to serve in it. Explain why you think it's the most important court. Because it's the court that affects children's lives and children's families, and no other court does it like we do and can do. And and if you don't do it right, you can really mess things up forever. And and 
and I'm sure I've made a million mistakes, but the point is, is that it's the most important court in that regard, and it's the one that gives you the opportunity, I think, to make the most difference. Um, I know that, that there are courts, such as appellate courts, that appeal to certain judges because of the intellectual challenges you get to have, but, you know, I just keep in company with 20 briefs, um, in an eight-hour day just doesn't ring my chime, but but being able to, but it does those people, but but for me personally, it just having that chance to 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 really make that difference, and um, and you know from my religious training and, and study, you know there's a um, a teaching in the Talmud, you know that says if you save one child, you save the world, and that, that's meant to mean that, that we, each of us, can change the world. We can, and I, we do, and, uh, um, and, and when you do it right for a child and for a family, I mean, you, you, you're changing the world, and, and it's literally that poignant, it's literally that thrilling. I mean, I'm not saying these epiphanies come every day, and, and not to mention the complete horror sometimes of cases that we have to hear, and the strain of it, and the chronicity of it, and, you know, until we may ever get to a certain wonderful point. Um, but we do get to those points, and we don't save every child, and we don't save every family. But, but done right, we we do we can do such great things. And I'm just I don't take credit ever for those things. I I'm just part of a system of greatness. I think that you know has the ability to to, to really do that. Though I'm tired, uh, <laughs> but but you know so sometimes when I fantasize about what it would be like to finally, you know, just rest and and put it away. Um, you know, I'll never ever uh, feel uh, burned out from it. Um, uh, I mean, I'll I'll leave it, but I'll I'll never feel that. I, w I was wondering what your when you first were appointed. Um, what adjustments? Did you have to make that first or second year, and um, and and how did you go about um, reviewing these cases, uh, and how many cases did you find yourself reviewing in those early years, and has that changed over the years? Well, the first adjustment is is that by nature I hate conflict, so I hate it. Um, so in my personal life, you see, I. And my personal relationships I mean I, I, um, I it's it's just something that, <laughs> that I, I can't tolerate and, and don't do well with um, so the first major adjustment is is just having to deal with conflict because remember with the people that are coming to you for the most part life is out of control and your job is to take control so and you're dealing with high conflict. So, so that was the first adjustment. The second is, is to do that, you have to literally be, uh, as one of my friends says, uh, a great lawyer, Ellen Wyman, says you have to be a, a control freak. And, and you do, I mean, you have to take control. So you have to have courage. Um, and even if it's not your nature, you have to be courageous, and you have to to insist on things that may not be your nature. I, if I, if there was one doubt uh, I that got back to me about whether or not I would be a good judge, I remember when I went on the bench, it was that a lot of people thought, well, Phil is just too nice a guy. You know, he, you know, he want, he's the great. Comp, you know, he's the great healer. He likes people to get together and compromise, and and but you know, so he may not make a good judge because you can't necessarily do that. You've got to be firm. You've got to be courageous. You've got to take control, and and that so that was a huge, huge thing. Um, in addition, 
though I can't say I had a ton of lawyer friends, I had wonderful support from the bar and their um, endorsing me to get this position. So it became difficult when I had to, when that curtain came down because I'm not any longer one of them. I mean, I understand them, I came from them, but I'm not now one of them. And, and that was hard because you have this tendency not to want to hurt your fee the feelings of a colleague or, uh, or because of a decision that you're making. They may not see eye to eye with you, and, and so that's very difficult. And, and in order to sort of establish that, required me almost severing some, not friendships, but certainly the way that tie was. Um, the third, I guess, big change is you know how I made sure I conducted myself. Um, what I mean by that is is that. Um, something as silly as being in your car stopped at a light making sure you weren't picking your nose because that person next to you might see that and say you know I saw Judge Trumpeter picking his nose um, it's that it's that ridiculous but it really is and 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 it gets back to you I um, people say that all the time I mean they'll 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 comment about something that I did in a grocery store or you know that I dropped a pear but he picked it up but he dropped that pear um, so it, it, it's 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 that kind of very um, very public you're very much in the public now I don't know if all judges suffer from that as much as for example I might from Roanoke. Roanoke's not a small town, but it's certainly not a big town. So it's a big town with sort of small town features. So I'm a big guy in that area, and and for better or for worse, I, you know, I hope I have a nice reputation, but we all would hope that. But, but nevertheless, you're going to be looked at. So those were three big, big changes that, you know, early on, you know, really do hit you. And then the, the last thing is, is that our children, uh, Jessica and Jason, were um, just babies then, and so making decisions about putting them, which we did, in the public school system was huge because they were always Judge Trumpeter's children, and, and I know that put a lot of pressure on them. Now, thank God they are perfect in every way, and they are perfect in every way, and they always have been. But I remember that I, uh, and, and what's thrilling is the pride they have in me and what it is that I do to this day. I mean, and they've always felt that way. And I mean, I, I mean, I just would kiss their feet when I would come home after I kissed my wife's, you know, because there was a lot on her, I'm sure, too. So, um, so those were all the differences, if you will, um, of, of being a judge. Why did you and your wife decide to put your children in public school? Because that's where they should be. You know, that's the real, that's real life. Those are real people. And, and we wanted to make sure they were grounded. We, you know, we could have lived in the nicest uh, development in town, but we purposely didn't. You know, we could have sent them to private schools, but we purposely didn't. And, um, I'm not saying we deserve any great pat on the back, but it's just to say that we indulge them enough, and, and I think parents, sadly and rightfully, struggle as it is that with all that we can give our children, we want to make sure they stay grateful, that they stay grounded, um, that they're that we're tending to really monitoring, you know, what is the what is the nature of our children's heart and soul, not their, again, uh, their resume <laughs> to get into the right everything. So um, that's why we made that decision to put them into public school. And um, our son, the oldest, was um, great always. Just he, he was, you know, Mr. Best all around and, and actually was voted that, you know, was a big man on campus great guy, everybody's friend, good athlete, you know, good student, and, and, and Jessica, 
our daughter was more reserved and, and, and just didn't like attention brought to herself. And bless her heart, and, and, and people laugh about this, but it's really very sad because she was our daughter. You know, there's not many guys who are going to knock on Judge Trumpeter's door to take out his daughter on a date. So she was well liked in school, you know, and, and editor of the yearbook and a class officer, but when the bell rang at the end of the day, life was over for her, you know, because no one wanted her around because, you know, she had, I think, unfortunately, a class of students with her who were always into stuff. and. They just didn't want her around, and and uh, and from a parent standpoint, of course, that's nice. But 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 from her standpoint, it was painful, and we saw that. So um, we struggled uh, really at making sure for both of them that that everything was okay, and and uh, and the the promise that we made was if you will just get through this. Uh, for better or for worse, but if you're feeling the worst, just know that you may go to any college in the United States or world and I'll pay for it. I don't care what it costs. So, uh, but Jason, funny enough, only wanted to go to UVA for the fourth grade and thank goodness he got in and he went. Uh, so Jessica did really take us up on the offer and she went up to the Northeast. So she went to Boston University and then got a second degree at NYU. So, um, but that was cute. And, they, they just did a great job, but it, it was hard. It's hard on them because I know many judges whose children are um, not well grounded, and and you know, and they struggle, and and of course you're going to be identified, and 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 it's it's unfair to those children, and it's unfair to those judges. Although I have to make a confession, and I really mean this. Um, I think had my kids struggled, I would have left the bench um, for a number of reasons. Well, two reasons. One, because I would want to tend to them if that was causing that much strain on them. But secondly, <coughs> and I don't know, I guess there are people who wouldn't agree with me, but I, I think that um, to do what I do for a living. The community expects me to be a good husband and a good father. And, um, and because I'm making decisions about children and families. And I think if, if I can't ask myself, am I a great husband and a great father, or do I try to be a great husband and great father, um, and do I have something to show for that? Um, I think, I don't know that I, it would uh, have been right for me to uh, be audacious enough to stay on the bench and make these important decisions. Uh, I, I just think that, uh, that litigants could rightfully say, well, why, why are you fussing with me or telling me what to do when you have this situation or that in, within your own family. And um, I don't know, there are some who might say, well, one has nothing to do with the other. But, but for me personally, I, I would have struggled with that. And knowing myself as well as I do, there's no question I would have left the bench had that been an issue. So when I say they were perfect in every way, I'm grateful to them more than they'll ever know. I try to always tell them that. but. But thankfully, they, they, they're very prideful about what I do do for a living, and their support has really meant everything. So. It seems then that your role as a father was cru crucial to how you looked at your role as a judge. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about some of the cases that you've <clears throat> had to look at and mm -hmm. decide on. Um, can you think of any that really um, was from the, the perspective of your role as a father, um, how you looked at the case, how you decided the case, or dealt with the young people in that particular case? Did, did you see yourself in, maybe in one or two situations more as, as if you were talking as a father to them? 
Uh, yes, I guess. But well, let me let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. I think the the tension that that exists within me is that whatever case that I hear involving children or families, I have rules that I have to go by, and they're the statutes and the case law. So the tension is is how do you apply that to the real life drama that's going on in your courtroom? So I have to follow the law, but then I have this other tension about, yes, but this is my experience, and, and can I bring anything to this decision in plugging in those criteria and those laws and that information to in the best way possible, you know, decide this case. There's no question that the second that I open my mouth, given what I do for a living, you know, I'm preachy, I'm, I'm a demagogue, I'm <laughs> fatherly, I'm wise, I'm a son of a gun, I'm all kinds of things, depending on who the audience is or what the decision is. Um, and that's why they have the right to appeal. <laughs> but, but uh, I, you know, I, there's no, qu and I know this in myself that I do tend to um, explain my decisions maybe a little, in a little bit more detail than one might, the, another judge might. So I might be considered too talky. Um, I think it's important for people to know why I make my decision. I think it's important for people to know how I'm viewing their situation because if I'm tending to them and it's probably going to be a fairly long-term relationship, not just a one hearing pop, you know, I mean, it's, we're going to have a, a time together. So, so I think that, that, um, that I bring all of that to this job needless to say. I mean, I can, um, I can appreciate, for example, if I've got a child who's before me who's run away from home and the reason that they ran away is because they perceive that their mother and father don't like them or don't love them. Well, as a father, I'm sure there are times, I know there are times, based on things that I had to decide with my wife their mother that were not necessarily popular decisions for my kids where they, they, they would perceive that we don't love them or we don't respect them or we don't trust them or we don't like them. So, you know, have I been there? Do, do I bring that experience that's helpful? Of course I do. Uh, so I think in that respect, um, all of the you know, any life experience that I have that that's bef that is similarly before me but in turmoil at that point is is going to give me insight. I'm not saying it's going to be determinative on how it is that I make a decision, but it will, I hope, make me more empathetic. Um, I think as a judge, too, that every time someone sits in the witness stand that I have an obligation to try to put myself in his or her place. Um, even if I don't necessarily agree with them, you know, that's my job, to put myself in, in, in order to understand where you're coming from and what your perspective is. And it kind of goes back to those differences again and people, you know, don't necessarily have my upbringing and, and, and are going through things that, thank God, I've never had to. So. So um, I think in that respect that um, I'm bringing all of that, I guess, to the table. Well, you're, some of the decisions that I've read about that you may emphasize this, this role of discipline mm -hmm. uh, and even some degree of punishment. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about what, how you define punishment and how that fits into uh, the strategies for helping the youth who go through your courtroom. Well, to describe what my my 
um, understanding of punishment is, I think I have to first define what I what my view of discipline is. And I think that generally in the street or in most American families, when you use the word discipline, that you're really talking punitive, you're talking oppressive, you're talking punishment. Um, that's not my definition of discipline. Discipline for me is structure, being a good guide and mentor, um, um, setting boundaries, holding you responsible, not just for bad decisions, but for good ones, as a well-known uh, child counselor says, you know, try to catch your children doing something good, not just doing something bad. Um, it's love, it's uh, understanding, and more. And that's how I define discipline. So, again, if I've got some, using your example as a kid who's in trouble by breaking the law, then I want to impose discipline, meaning I want to impose all of those things. Am I going to hold you accountable? I am. You know, so will you pay the piper, so to speak, in, in some act of redemption to assure that as part of this process you learn from it and grow from it? Yes, it is. You know, whether it's a community service obligation or a fine or serving time in detention or being on probation or any particular program, that, yes, I mean, that, that's what I mean. Um, for I, I'm sure for many kids, well I know this to be the case, uh, that just the thought of going before me is is um, unnerving and frightening, and uh, for some almost in their minds maybe more than they could bear, and punishment enough. Uh, I. Though it's not allowed, I get word that police who stop kids uh, just in the course of their job, uh, my name will come up and they're terrified. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's just, I know certain things go on. I mean, when you've done this for 24 and a half years and you're a person of the community, from that community, you know, as I tell kids all the time, we all have a reputation, I have a reputation, and, and all, of, uh, all of our reputations are based on what we do. So what I do is I impose this discipline with that definition. Um, do they hear that it's basically punishment? Probably. Um, you know, because they're scared. Um, they've broken the law. But as I say all the time, too, to kids and adults, you know, breaking the law is just nothing more than bad manners. So if you're a kid and you've got these bad manners, um, that says something about your character and, and what can I put in place to make sure that that gets straightened around. And, and uh, uh, But I, I think also when we talk about discipline and punishment, that there is sadly a perception out there, especially with many parents who mistake trust for uh, respect or discipline. And you should always trust your children, but you should always have in play structure. And one has nothing to do with the other, but sadly so many parents I think throw out the discipline piece, the structure piece, uh, and put in its place the trust, but they have to be together. And so, so in the process, again, our statute permits this, and I use it very frequently, is I impose certain obligations on the parents. So when things are amiss in that department, you know, we try to tend, tend to that as well. Um, do I perceive that I am uh, perhaps regarded as tough or stern or, you know, I'm really going to hold you accountable, um, probably so. But, you know, whenever a judge speaks in a setting like that, just like with some parents or most parents, uh, we don't raise our voices, but if we've got to correct you or say something to you, um, 
if it if it even gets in that child's head, they will more often than not say that you screamed at me. You know, boy, Judge Trumpeter screamed at me. He told me he screamed at me about this or that, and and it makes me laugh because I don't scream ever in the courtroom. Of the many many cases that you have had to. Um, render decisions uh, on. What case or cases have been the most uh, difficult for you, that really stand out in your mind as being difficult to render a decision or difficult to, to deal with? Um, because many people take burdens home with them, uh, especially in these kinds of jobs. And so I was wondering if you had some cases that were particularly difficult and why were they difficult? Well, I can literally say every day I have cases that are very difficult, that I struggle with, uh, that I worry about uh, for the child and for that family. Um, and of course, in 24 and a half years, it's probably too many to count. I, anticipating that I was going to be asked a question like that, um, there, there's one case, and I mention it only because I mention it um, at least twice a month in public, um, and it's um, because in Virginia, we are the only state in our nation that requires teens who want to get a driver's license to come to court to receive their license in a special ceremony with a parent. And so um, many years ago, um, through some work I had done with the uh, National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges and NHTSA in Washington, I had developed a program that is still being um, done by me today in the issuance of the ceremonies with the theme being uh, why do we have a law in Virginia that says you cannot drink until you're 21? Uh, and it really goes back to the issue of children's health and the fact that just in that one area alone it's their it's our children's number one public health problem today because just in in alcohol related crashes it's their number one killer and this came to, even though I had started on this project many years before this particular case, there came to me a case uh, that happened um, um, about 15 years ago. It happened during Christmas. It was Christmas Eve. And, uh, when it happened, funny enough, my family and I were away on vacation. We weren't in Roanoke. I came back and saw it in the news. It was a horrendous case. And it involved a teacher in Roanoke County who lived in Salem, near my courthouse. And she was uh, walking in her neighborhood with her husband on the sidewalk to deliver a cake to to a neighbor uh, for Christmas and as I tell the story uh, and I'm shortening it but it they noticed as they were walking that there was a car at the entrance of the street that was stopped for quite some time it was running had its lights on and the driver was a 16 year old boy named Travis and Travis was an extraordinary senior at one of the high schools, public high schools there. And he, at that time, and still perhaps to this day, was their youngest valedictorian uh, that was about to come through. He was, he had movie star good looks. He, uh, I believe was, um, well, I know for sure he was um, admitted into University of Virginia on a scholarship. As I recall, he may have been nominated or, or chosen as a Jefferson Scholar. Uh, he was a championship tennis player and a great athlete. But for about two and a half years before that night was a full-blown alcoholic. No one ever said anything about it. 
I never knew, this kid never came on my radar screen, but people knew he was a heavy drinker, and no one ever said anything about it. Even people at school knew about it. Um, and so he was the kid in that car, and for reasons that we'll never know, he zoomed down that street where, where um, Mrs. Kitts was her name, um, was walking with her husband, and we were told that his speed reached almost 80 miles an hour, he lost control of the vehicle, went onto the sidewalk, and hit and killed Mrs. Kitts instantly. It took them, sadly, though, many hours for them to find her body because the impact was so great that, and she was thrown so far, and it was such a dark, cold night. Um, that, that case was poignant for me because it was a sign to me. And, and I mention it, as I mention it all the time in this ceremony because of this program I do and this exercise I do with kids about why we have this law and why it's so important that you not drink and you obey this law. <clears throat> because um, not only was Mrs. Kitts killed and therefore it destroyed her family, and their son was a classmate of this defendant named Travis, but you know how it literally ruined Travis's life. Um, at the time, um, the statute uh, in the nature of the laws at that time, uh, from the juvenile court laws perspective, was not uh, an offense for which this child would have been transferred for trial as an adult. Um, the, the, the level of that particular charge was not what it is today as a result of that case, quite frankly. And because of the fact that Travis had no prior criminal record and, uh, and the status of that kind of charge at the time, though the Commonwealth perfunctorily made a request that he be tried as an adult, we all knew even the prosecutor, that, that that was not going to be happening. So there was a great community outcry, needless to say, that, well, if Travis was going to be tried as a juvenile, what would have been the very worst sentence he would have gotten for killing this woman? And it would have been committed for less than a year to a juvenile correctional facility. Well, that's really what happened, and that's really how it did play out. But, but what was particularly poignant is, is that Travis always wanted to be a doctor. I mean, he had said that as, for himself as a goal. Of course, he lost that admission to UVA. I mean, his life was literally destroyed, and he was locked up uh, in a juvenile correctional facility. But he told me at his sentencing, that he promised me that he was going to make good on his dream, and he, and he was going to do just that. And um, so some years went by, and as it turned out, my own son, Jason, was admitted to the engineering school at UVA. And when we went there to take him to college, um, they had a cadre of students assisting throughout the university grounds, um, these new first-year students, and in the gymnasium was a nice-looking guy who was, you know, helping the new students, and he comes up to me and he says, hi, Judge Trumpeter, I'm Travis. Well, <sighs> he got himself back. And a few years after that, he, um, he wrote me a letter, and he had gotten into medical school, and he had gotten into a residency, and he just wanted me to know. And uh, so we say that kid. So that was a big case. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. It sounds like... Um cases like that where someone really, really follows their word is yeah. kind of rare, although perhaps They're not, not rare. 
it's just that that was they're not rare um we we they're just not that dramatic mm. thank god <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't do that all the time but what i mean by that is is that <clears throat> Just small things or small successes can make all the difference in the world and the life of any child, you know, or, or any family that I'm asked to, you know, make a decision about. And so, you know, that was an extraordinarily dramatic case in terms of its facts. But, but it doesn't have to be that someone, God forbid, dies over an incident for something wonderful to happen. I mean, wonderful things and extraordinary things and poignant things, you know, can happen all the time. You know, it, it, it can be something uh, in a child abuse case that had a happy ending. For example, um, next month um, we'll celebrate with many other courts throughout the nation Adoption Saturday and, and in my jurisdiction we do that and we have one of our circuit judges finalize certain adoptions for some of our kids who've been in foster care and who have these nice adoptive families and you know so I get cards and pictures and letters you know about these children all the time and and um, or it could be just uh, an issue about a, a kid who you know, came before me and, you know, as a teen was shy and depressed and we just got them a little help and it made all the difference in the world and they'll come up and you may not remember them, but, you know, they'll thank you for what, you know, what little thing you did. I mean, and they make me cry just as much as that one did. But, but those are fabulous, you know, victories. You know, is it a, you know, can it, is it heart-wrenching? and gut-wrenching, you know, it is. I mean, I tell people, when they say, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm in the human misery business. And, and, you know, and it really is. I mean, that's, people are, for the most part, miserable as they're entering my courtroom because of a miserable situation or a horrible situation. Um, it, it, and, and, you know, they can be pretty torn up. So when I say it's the most important court in the land, you know, that's why. You know, I say that. So. How did you make that adjustment emotionally um, to to go through twenty four years and still loving it, still still really finding because because I am still kind of euphoric that I get to be part of a system that can make this difference. Uh, again, I don't take any credit for anything that I do, but that's what gets me through. You know. And not just the fact that I have a fabulous wife and fabulous kids, you know, who are supportive, but what, what also is, is that when I come home at night, you know, I know that I get to be part of a system, you know, that is um, not just has its heart in the right place, but, you know, is, is really taking important strides and, and measures to, to, to make some great differences and you know in the lives of our community and that's that's what gets me going that's what thrills me um, because Lord knows there are many things that just beat me down and and I don't mean just the cases I mean we're talking about just silly things like the administrative stuff I mean that can beat you down and and um, and you know some other people and other related systems who you might think or I might think are not doing their part and but you can't jackhammer these people out of those positions with you know jackhammer them to get out of the way so to speak so you know those are real frustrations um, and you know s policy changes move slowly and that beats you down um, and uh, so, and there are ideas that I might have, and I just can't get them executed for any numbers of other reasons, and that can beat you down. So, um, so what gets me up is that you know I'm still that part of that system that really can make a big difference. Now you had to um, go through a, a period, and all the judges, especially in the juvenile court system had to go through a period in Virginia in the 1990s and early 2000 
where um, there was the the sort of politicizing of of uh, uh, juvenile or I should say decisions made for juveniles. This idea that that juveniles were cast as violent murderers and criminals and all of this. And I was wondering, um, because you did speak out a bit about that, uh, what were your experiences during that period? And, and were you successful in, in getting some changes made, uh, moving it back to perhaps where it was before? Well, I, I didn't like my experiences in that day, um, in that regard. Um, I, um, I do respect the three branches of government and the fact that they each um, are, uh, are very, not only important, but we have to respect the sanctity of each one. Um, so I, more than anyone, understand and appreciate that it's not nice to dabble or tell another branch of government how to do business. Um, but in this case, um, I just really felt that, um, that the, the science and the data was showing that the, that the longer we could keep the children in our system, that those children fared better than children who were treated as adults. And if the goal from public policy is public safety and, and making sure that they're not going to be repeat offenders, then why not respect that science? And why not then enhance it? Um, but human nature being what it is, um, you know, people say all the time that you know, they don't want the eye for the eye, but I'm not so sure that that's true. I, uh, I never cease to be amazed uh, how I think society does have that sort of vengeful streak and they do want their pound of flesh. Um, and when they say they just want justice, they, they what I sometimes think <laughs> that's just a euphemism for I, you know, I want I want vengeance. Um, so I understand that, and um, I I think the part that that I was had a little bit more hope about, and I think has come to play out, that for the most part, even uh, though there is judicial discretion that was taken away from us, uh, where now it's an automatic for example, try as an adult on certain charges, if that were still within our discretion, for the most part, we would have made a decision to have that kid tried as an adult anyway. So I did, you know, so I sort of, after taking a few deep breaths, realized that, that for that category of child, it would have probably played out that way anyway. I, the part that, that I was a little more concerned about was the, um, the broadcasting, if you will, of public information about the child at these very young ages, uh, especially just from the moment they were charged. And, and I was concerned about, about um, that issue of confidentiality because I'm smart enough to know in real life that when kids get in trouble, everybody knows who the kid is. Everybody. I mean, that neighborhood knows and that school knows because all the kids are talking. You know, I kid kids all the time when I speak to them in their classes and youth groups and civic groups. You know, I say, you know, which court is the most talked about court in Roanoke? It's Judge Trumpeters. And who's doing all that talking? It's you kids whose confidentiality and privacy I'm trying to protect. And so, so you know, that's bad enough that they're, they're you know, innocent enough, if you will, to sort of spill the beans to other people when they shouldn't be doing that. But, but from a public policy standpoint, I just don't think it's the right thing to do to sort of squish these kids like a bug in terms of their name. Because, you know, when I grew up, my folks always taught me that my good name is my most precious asset. And, and, and we can impose sanctions and, again, discipline and the definition that I 
think of and consequences, you know, without tearing a, a child down and destroying them forever um, by humiliation. I mean, we don't, I don't want humiliation and, and that's not justice. So I was concerned at the time about the sort of opening of the doors to just from the moment the kid got charged, uh, we're not even talking about conviction. I mean, from the moment they were charged that the press had access to these kids' names, that was the part that really bothered me. But, but um, the other way in real life that did play out is that, <laughs> that I always invited the press and wished the press would give more attention to our court and the important work that we do. So I, I guess I turned it around and said back to the press, well, now that you have access, I hope you really will come. And funny enough, they they don't they still don't come. So so for the most part, you know, except in these rare occasions, uh, across the board, I I I'm I, I'm thinking that even though these statutes and public policy change in that regard, that that thankfully uh, the way it plays out is it's not quite as harmful. Thank goodness, as I thought it just might be. Have you? Um uh, well, you've you've done a lot of what I would term advocacy, uh, looking at and addressing these needs that you see coming through the court. Um, you've been serving on some committees, and I was hoping you would tell us a little bit about some of the committees and, and what you really see as important uh, issues and changes that probably need to happen to make our society better. <laughs> Well, I, um, I think that any programs or committees that I've had the privilege of either helping to start um, or, or to be a part of, I, I would never be so grandiose as to think that, that but for me, we wouldn't have these wonderful uh, changes. I, I think that um, in, in terms of um, of things that I worry about for our kids and families today is um, I still worry about the issues particularly of alcohol uh, which is still our kids number one drug of choice though drug use is down um, sadly I still think there's a great acceptance uh, within communities or by parents that this is still an innocent rite of passage or somehow this substance is okay so I'm hoping more and more through work of, of our, um, you know, of people in a leadership role that we can, through education and continued advocacy, you know, make sure that they understand that these are health issues for our children. Uh, it's not a moral issue. So, so I think that, that that's something that I would like to continue to strive to do. There's no question that the... Um, um, that I think that a lot of today's parents are behind the learning curve about issues of, uh, of uh, some pretty toxic stuff that our kids can get exposed to, not just in pop society, but particularly over the internet. You know, I remember when I started work, um, I used to um, say uh, to audiences a phrase that one of my broadcast friends came up with, and that is uh, to make sure parents understood that you should regard your television as a stranger in your home. Well, now I, when I speak to parents and groups and community, you know, I have to say you need to regard the computer as the devil in your home. And it's not to say that it isn't a great tool, it is. And it's not to say I don't want you to have one, because I do. But it's just to say that, unfortunately, there are so many parents out there who feel that they know so little about it that they can't control this monster. Uh, some do know very little about it, but some, you know, know more than they think they know and can be easily trained. So I, I'm worried about what's happening in this generation, so to speak, until this generation becomes parents and can kind of get on top of that because the, they, they are savvy to it. But of course, we'll always be concerned about what 
sort of um, pop culture may be straying our kids to do, but but um, but needless to say, uh, Roanoke City, for example, has as was just reported last week, the state's second highest teen pregnancy rate. Um, so those are issues that you know continue. I think that we need to continue to, to take on, but there's no committee or program or effort that's ever going to be able to take on the big monster of just the, the huge uh, movement of whatever today's popular society would be, whether we're living in 1820 or the first century or in, you know, 2009. Um, every, every generation's parents complained about how out of control their children were and what what's really going to become of them because of what they're doing. I think they're going to be just fine. Um, and uh, But I, again, uh, want to make sure that our parents don't lose steam and sort of emancipate their kids in the eighth grade. It's not the kids that I, I that are different or bad, it, it's, it's the way our kids are being parented that I think is changing and I, uh, that I worry about and I think that we need to focus our efforts on. How, how is that different now? How do you observe the difference in how parents parent? Well, from my courtroom observations, I'm observing that, again, they're using the prior expression that parents are emancipating their kids in the eighth grade. You know, as I say, what you see is not what you get. You know, most of these kids are maturing uh, physically much faster than their parents did or their grandparents did. Um, I mean, they, they have literally adult-looking bodies and they're very young teens. And, and I think a lot of parents mistake that, that you know, what they're looking at it doesn't mean that what's inside that cranium is uh, it by any any means uh, fully developed. So um, I'm I'm worried about issues of parents' perceptions about you know putting in place these boundaries and structure. Uh, I I worry about issues of, of substance use. I worry about issues of um, just the struggles that parents have today and and trying to to do it all. And you can't do it all. And you can't have it all. And um, uh, and my community remarks have been for many years, and it's tended to be a very almost um, um, and people are aghast sometimes when I say this, but um, but this is a true story. Last uh, spring, I was at a Juvenile Diabetes Foundation uh, dinner, and a lady came up to me in, in the buffet line, and she said. Judge Trumpeter, my name is so-and-so, you don't know me, but some years ago I attended a workshop that you did about good parenting skills, and you told me that I should quit my job when my kids reach middle school, and I did. Well, I didn't say you should quit your job in middle school, but I was asked a question about, about, um, about making sure that your kids were being supervised. And my comment was, well, to be honest with you, if I had a choice in today's world, um, because of the quality of daycare that is available out there, if you had the ability to stay at home for only one phase of your child's life and go to work at the other phase, that I think our society has it backwards. I would vote that you leave the house and go to work from infancy until eighth grade and then come back in the eighth grade until they're 18. And the reason I said that is, is because that's the high risk years, that's when kids are going to experiment, that if you know, if you're not there and you don't see, then you don't know what they are doing. And so that's the time that you need to put in place that structure. So I said, so if you err in a family that has the luxury that either the father or the mother can come back into the home versus doing it from infancy until the kids go off to, you know, elementary school or, or middle school, then my vote would be for just the opposite. 
And funny enough, this woman came, comes up to me and said, I did just that. And, and even more funny, she said, and I just want to thank you because it was the best decision I ever made. Well, but I, I didn't mean, though, for, the, for her to, to, to quit her job or lose her focus or, or not have any meaning in her life. And, and particularly because it was a woman, I didn't want it perceived that I was making a sexist remark because, you know, that was not the case. I just said, if one, if the mother or the father have that, that, that luxury. So, so I guess, um, you know, people do take to heart things that you say as a community leader and, um, and you just never know how that's going to come back to visit you. It's interesting. If someone... Um was interested in in doing what you do. What would you um, either warn them about, make suggestions about, uh, try to prepare them to uh, understand? Uh, is a typical day for you as a juvenile court judge? Well, if someone were to ask me, you know, what should you? you know, what advice would I give you? I, I would say two things. One, you have to be courageous. I mean, you have to just be courageous. It's, it's hard to make these hard decisions, and they're usually not popular. Um, for example, if you've got a kid who's just totally out of control, it is not easy to have to tell your bailiff to take a kid into custody and put them in a detention facility and they're crying and wailing and their mother is crying and wailing. These are not, you know, you have to be pretty courageous, so to speak, to do this day in and day out or to, in a custody case, when moms and dads refuse to work together and you have to make a heart-wrenching decision about where a child's going to be most of the time, you know, that you have to be so courageous to be able to make that decision. And, and, you, and then the second thing I would say is that you have to be decisive. I mean, you can't dilly-dally. You, you've got to be decisive because, again, that's part of taking control. And, and that's hard, you know, I mean, because you want the luxury of thinking and thinking and, oh, well, let me talk to so. I mean, you don't, you, you cannot do that. So you want to get people's input and make informed decisions. And I guess, though, I just said two things. The, the third thing is you, just, you have to be persistent. I mean, if you're going to take on this work, I hope you're not going to just be a flash in the pan, as they say. I mean, I, I, I've often thought if anyone asked me, you know, what would you most want to be remembered as, as a judge, I, I guess I'd like I, I hope that they would say that I wasn't a flash in the pan. Um, and, and that's, I guess, would be my advice. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>